What we learned in trying to uh, understand the, the neutrino mass, its origin, somehow how to place it in the standard model, that it's very convincing that it ought to be by random. We have no proof. <coughs> it's just that we look from various angles, okay? Remember what we said first? The real difference, I mean, after all, you have neutrino and the electron in the same doublet, and yet M nu is less than a million <coughs> times smaller than M e, which is an interesting puzzle. And the only difference between these two guys is the neutrality of neutrino. So if you use that, so if you use the fact that Q nu is zero, then you are literally led just by by the sheer possibility, you are led to possibility of my random mass. Moreover, if there are no new states, if you believe that the standard model is a complete story in terms of the light physical state, then of course neutrino comes out to be my Rana. Remember we found out that the only type of the master we could write would involve two Higgs doublet. This is the mentioned five line where Of course, it doesn't tell us where it's come from. It doesn't tell us anything except that it wants to be my Rana, okay? So that was another way of, of, of reasoning. Uh, and then we tried the natural thing to add the right-hand neutrino, and it took us to the seesaw picture, right? <coughs> And somehow I ended up working here more with the left-handed, right-handed neutrino, if I may use a play of words, which is C nu R bar transpose. But this particular convention, right? This is the same particle. We did it just in order to have a mass matrix for nu L and then that. Okay. And and then we got, and we even generalize it to uh, to n generation. I think this is what we call. I'm not sure now. I think this is what we call M Dirac, right? There was an ambiguity of what we had put on M Dirac, what M Dirac transpose the relative notion between two is important to us. So I think this is what we took. And we uh, block diagonalize it to get mass matrix by performing a rotation which I call U transpose. Put it in the diagonal form, which was m nu, zero, and m n. We treat m n as heavy. So this is roughly this. And uh, m nu is minus m dirac transpose, m n to the minus one, m dirac. And U was one, I think I call this minus theta matrix, theta dagger one, I'm pretty sure. And with this we found, you remember what theta was? Yeah. I don't remember the order. I can look it up, but it would help me if you... Mn to the minus one Md or the other way around? M N minus one Md <coughs> to the minus one. Sorry? M N to minus one Md. Great. Mm -hmm. And then this is a sort of celebrated 
but now for the mechanism, a way of explaining the smallness of neutrino mass. And I kind of argued against it, in spite of being one of the fathers of this thing, okay? I'm not happy with this for, for a few reasons that you said were essential. First, in other words, okay, uh, well, okay, let's see pro and con. So pro A, well, it's true that if Mn is large, <coughs> it gives us naturally the smallness of neutrino compared to charged leptons as long as M Dirac were to be a water M lepton. All of it natural. Okay, sounds neat. B We have a Majorana nature, this is kind of nice, according to this picture, Majorana nature, and therefore we said there will be likely neutrino as double beta decay, okay? This is what we like, lepton number violation. Con. A. I can't solve for M Dirac. Because in order for this to be really successful, I shouldn't predict M Dirac, okay? I should be able to disentangle this. In other words, if you give me neutrino masses, I should be able to predict physical processes, okay? M Dirac will give me the case of N, Higgs, whatever, okay? And we couldn't because there was a huge arbitrariness, if you remember, of it, orthogonal complex matrix. This solves. This solves this. With any of that satisfies orthogonality in this complex. And it can be huge. In other words, from here we can choose, we can make no predictions whatsoever. That's not something we could call the theory of, of phenomena. Okay. At this point, it starts to look more like semantics. Because you could even say, ah, good, okay. And, and, and neutrino light tells me that Mn is big. I don't know what comes first, because I don't really know an Mn. In, in the Sander model, Mn would be just a parameter. It's not associated with any physics. Okay. okay, and the other thing is, of course, the in order for this for you to accept it one day, you want you to produce, you would like to produce n. And notice that this is how you produce n. Okay, this is n coupled, n coupling to standard model states must be proportional to theta. Do you agree? If theta is zero, this guy is a singlet. He doesn't know even that there is a standard model. He has all the quantum numbers, uh, gauge quantum number zero. And that means that M Dirac, if I want to produce it, M Dirac has to be large. But if M Dirac is large, I don't have a C, so I can do that. After all, this can be large. But then there is no C, so okay. I'm not even consistent with myself. I started the diagonalization of this matrix made sense only uh, by, by assuming that M Dirac was small. Now I wanted the weak to produce it, okay. So this is achieved, okay. Possible in principle. So that O is large. But then, not cease. In other words, one is not valid. This whole thing is sort of eating your own tail, right? We assumed one which gave us all by taking all, get large, don't I should go back and then I have to diagonal this terrible matrix, okay? And you, you and I don't want to do that, it's a mess. Even for one generation, right? Square root of 
And I would say even a, a C, I don't like, this is a personal love statement, a sort of kind of outlook on physics. I don't like us to take a certain phenomena and then stick the particle to explain the phenomena. I would like us to have a theory. Whatever everything did before in physics was trying to get a theory, in other words, to have a framework that produces automatically by structure of amino mass. The way the standard model pre made its predictions, they all came from the structure. This is where it stopped. So I want to say a few more words on what could be such a theory, okay? Not too much, because we don't want to go beyond the standard model too much, okay? Just to give you a clear flavor. And then, uh, and then we should talk a bit more of the physics of my randomness. When I say produce it, when I say disentangle, when I say resolve CISO, Okay, I, 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 by that, okay, this was, I mean, in a machine analogous to LHC, or maybe a future collider, okay, this is for us seeing today, right? Okay. Let's keep this. Uh, this is true. If I have C, so this is a crucial parameter of C. So let's leave this con to see if I can do better. So the way C so merged, the whole picture of neutrino mass actually started with something which is called the left right symmetric theory. Mm -hmm. Actually, started here. The original idea started here by Salam and Fati suggesting that. They wanted to unify quarks and leptons. It was the beginning of, of grand unification. But in the process, they suggested, what if world would actually, not the standard model crippled, left-handed only, but its sort of left track symmetric completion. By the way, it's very interesting that if you ever, I, I don't think you would do that because we normally don't do that, if you were ever to look at the original paper of Lee and Yang, mm -hmm. that started it all, right? After all, it was the two of them that suggested the possibility of parity violation. Mm -hmm. And remember how it all cleared everything, you know, everything exploded. This was 1956. Mm -hmm. A year later, a year and a half later, already B minus A was established, you know, the whole structure that led to the the, the cornerstone that led to the standard model eventually. And they say something interesting if you read Li and Yang. The paper has about four pages. And these three pages they establish the arguments for having the world very parity. But then they say that deep down, according to them, the world ought to be left or asymmetric. They can't believe that fundamentally nature will choose such a crippled world. And they offer some arguments, okay? The picture that they offer is called mirror fermion today, it's ruled out. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? And it's more complicated than this here. So I'll just talk about this here. It was a kind of dream, a vision. Deep down they say the world should be left asymmetric, okay? And, and, and according to this picture, if I write like this, I'm of course making it left or symmetric, I have to do the same thing for quarks, if I take it seriously. That means that the gauge group would not be SU2L cross U1. Some U1 prime. Now, a few features, features that makes it appealing. The first, that in this theory, the charge, electromagnetic charge, would be T3L plus T3R, it will be symmetric. Okay, it becomes, everything becomes easier. If you wish, okay, even at the, at the level of bookkeeping, at the level of visualizing, remember the quantum numbers, everything is easier because of, 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 of the equality of left and right. There, we had to suffer. Every time I had to ask you a hypercharge for left and right, and I would see you stuck and going back and trying to understand what it is, okay. So, by definition, the world must be left and right symmetric. So in other words, there is also a left right symmetry here. It changes the left and right. Okay, this is the underlying 
assumptions and some new quantum number. Hypercharge prime. Maybe. Now what is this hypercharge prime? Do you remember what was the you can just think of the left hand, forget the uh, of the of the left handed guys, because it will be the same. Do you remember what it was, the hypercharge on the left handed guys? If I write down hypercharge here, it was minus one. It was one third here. You can look. Uh, have a look at your notes. Now notice what. Notice this neat thing that. What is a. Uh, what is a quark? After all, what is a quark? Well. It's something that variants are made of, right? So they actually carry a variant number, a third of a variant number. In other words, I can say that the variant number of a quark is one third. The lepton number of a quark is zero, by definition. The variant number of a lepton is zero. The lepton number of a lepton is one. So notice that this number has a simple meaning that's B minus L. If the world were to be symmetric, the problem was that you couldn't interpret it that way because there were right-handed guys whose hypercharges were completely different, nothing to do with this magical number. Okay? B minus L is a very interesting combination of B and L. When you learn about anomalies, which are very important in field theory because they destroy your anomalizability, you will learn that there is a particularly important number in the standard model which is anomaly free, <coughs> B minus L. Meanwhile, you will just learn that in such a theory, the hypercharge is simply B minus L. Easy to remember. Mm. Now when I ask you in the well this can help you if you wish, this can help you to remember the hypercharges of the left-handed guys. That is always B minus L, even in the standard model. Okay. Obviously. So I'm simply going to write for it. <coughs> Use the privilege of the back. So plus B minus L over 2. Mm -hmm. This is the first thing that we could take in favor of the theory. Well, the theory makes obvious assumption where there was a W boson plus minus. Now I should call it left actually because there's going to be another one, right? There'll be W plus minus right. And there was a Z boson. Maybe I should call it left, but that's a bit tricky. I don't know how to call it really. So here people have different people different notations because W is purely left-handed, but Z was not left-handed, remember? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Make sure left and right. Well, let's call them uh, the way we did W and Zeta. Let's put this in, in parentheses. And Z. And so there will be a Z prime. Or if you wanted to call it left, just to remember it's in the standard model, then you would call it right. But you double the structure, okay? So this may be uh, something against the model, it becomes more complicated, okay? Now, the question that we say, why is it that the world looks the way the, the, the standard, the, the, the Li and Yang envision, and Marsha Kesuda has a problem. Why does it world look left to us? Well, it's simply the left-handedness of the world is equivalent with M W R much bigger with than M W M Z prime <coughs> much bigger than M Z obviously that's not a big deal there could be all kinds of new physics okay millions of new states of new gauge bosons okay especially if for some reason you believe in so-called strings are going to a the underlying physical objects are, are not particles but but this so one dimensional strings that we call them whose oscillations give you all kinds of particle modes okay 
obviously you know, it's always possible as long as the new states are very heavy cool, yeah. If you want the if you want there to be less like symmetry, this also it's not the way too now, but the, the, the right handed guys are much heavier than the Right, so I have to break the symmetry. So this was the the uh, I call in a in a left right symmetric world they would have the same mass and the symmetry must be broken. So in other words, this you are you're faced with the situation. It's very interesting, okay, if you look at that they they sort of didn't take it seriously and later on Mohapatra Mati would follow on that. And this is an example where great physicist leaves things undone. Sort of feeling that this could not be achieved, that you couldn't break this spontaneously. But you and I know any symmetry, we, we, that should be obvious, should, we should be able to break it spontaneously if I can break the SU2 first time. Okay. But I'm glad you asked. So what we have to do uh, is, in other words, we must, we must break this left right symmetry. By the way, when I call left right symmetry, you know that there are two left right symmetries. One is parity. You know another left right symmetry? Charge conjugation. Charge okay. Strictly speaking, there are two possibilities. The people have explored both. Okay, I can tell you why. You mm. seem to have it. Yes. Um, if the particles get masses when uh, after the temperature of the universe is below 125 GB. Hey, <laughs> good question. Or because the top part is heavier than that, so until 125, it's still massless. Well, I don't. It's an it's it's, it's an essential question is cosmology. The trouble is that you and I don't know that the universe was hot. We like to imagine that it was. Mm -hmm. All we know, all we know with great degree of belief, that's, that's the great success of the standard model, that nucleosynthesis took place. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, the predictions of Bing Bangs, you know, yeah, are not to be doubted. But nucleosynthesis takes uh, uh, place at what temperature, more or less? Mm -hmm. At MeV. MeV. So strictly speaking, if you wish, all we know that the temperatures was say uh, 10 MeV, just to be safe that we can go through the whole process, maybe 100 MeV. That doesn't give us the right, strictly speaking, to to claim that if we had temperatures of orders of 100 GeV or whatnot. Yet, of course, we speculate that that is true. And if we were to take it seriously, then yes, there will be a phase transition. In other words, in the early universe, uh, the temperature much bigger then the scale of weak interaction, which is MW, you would have symmetry restoration. So mm -hmm. the universe will start looking like our universe only at the temperatures below. Mm -hmm. well, remember, it doesn't mean that much as it sounds to you, OK? You have to look for manifestations of that. Because even at MEV, the world is not the way we, you and I imagine it. There are these particles which are basically massless, most of them, in thermal equilibrium being scattered like crazy. Mm. That's a different subject. I'm strictly speaking all the time, I'm saying you get a zero temperature. For all practical purposes, okay, I know that today it looks strange that it's because zero temperature, right? Or yesterday it was a whole day. <laughs> but compared to the early universe, this is zero, right? <laughs> and the temperatures of the universe is almost zero, right? You know that few degrees Kelvin. If Paolo were to talk more of such issues, then we would try to uh, connect them in the standard model. Mm -hmm. But it's not like. Okay. So how would you do this breaking of parity? You would do through the Higgs mechanism. This is a natural thing to do. And that can be achieved. I don't think it's the uh, proper thing that I teach this. If those of you who are who are interested, I can give you. Mm. I can outline. Remember that the first example of symmetry breaking, or one of the very first, was actually an example of, spon of, of spontaneous symmetry breaking of discrete symmetry. Mm -hmm. Where could we do that? I didn't want to erase this. OK, this I can. 
let's let's leave this ambiguity of C. So. C sub B. C sub is defined in the standard model when you just add standard model plus a right hand new left on. The, the discrete symmetry example breaking was you take the potential, which is the one that illustrates everything that happens in more complicated cases of this form. And you say that phi transforms into minus phi. It's perfectly possible. This would break it. Now here we would have to take something somewhat different. If the gauge group is of this form, so this is the simplest discrete symmetry, phi goes into minus phi. Whereas the more complicated example would be, okay, I can sketch it. I will need, by the idea that there is a left-right symmetry, a field which is left-handed and a field which is right-handed, which should have its proper quantum numbers under SU2. Let me not specify even at the moment, just to, just to show you how this would work. There will be phi L and phi R. Maybe doublets, maybe triplets, maybe quadruplets, okay. We have always the dilemma that Weinberg had. They're going to each other by left right symmetry. So here the discrete symmetry would be phi L goes into phi R. The potential would have the form. There will be a minus mu square. Let me write with the original phi L square plus phi R square. But let me not, let me just write as if it's a simple, sorry. Let's just imagine real fields, okay? Let's, let's ignore for the moment, okay, the technicality of the group structure. Let's just emphasize the, the, the discrete aspect of the symmetry, okay? So for simplicity, I imagine these fields to be real scalars, just to illustrate what is going on, the way I did here. So the potential would look like minus mu square over 2, phi L square plus phi R square plus lambda over 4, phi L to the fourth plus phi R to the fourth plus lambda prime over 2, phi L square, phi R square. I write a quartic potential. You see, normally there could be cubic term, but that would be forbidden by the gauge structure, okay? You don't have cubic terms, okay? These are doublets or whatever they are. Okay, which I'm illustrating like this for simplicity. Okay, you agree? Mm -hmm. Potential would be a simple generalization of that one. Okay. I think it's maybe worth illustrating, okay, it's <laughs> the right moment, okay? This is the first paper I've written, and it's mind-bogglingly simple, and yet it was claimed that this was impossible to achieve, okay? And this is this interesting thing that find strange. I can write this, if you agree, as lambda over 4, phi L square plus phi R square. Takes a little toll, but after the homework of the two Higgs triplets, you remember the, the, the homework when you had two vectors? The crucial thing was to have a coupling, to have the pieces which didn't know about the relative orientation, and then have one coupling that knew. And that guy was the culprit. That guy decided what was happening, okay? So I'm just going to complete this to a square. And what I get here is lambda prime minus lambda over 2, phi L square, phi R square. I added the subtracted phi L square, phi R square to make a complete square here. And I'll let you stare at it for the moment. This is very similar to those triplets, okay? It's a completely different example. It's a discrete symmetry, but it's the same reasoning that you use, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Of course, eventually when you sit down and put this doublet and triplets, there'll be a lot of, lot of states that mix the, you know, you find the masses and so on. But here is the pattern, the crux of the issue. This, the only thing that I learned from this part of the potential is that phi L square plus phi R square in the minimum is non-zero. Mm -hmm. Mu square is negative. But I don't know in which direction the breaking is going. This part of the potential has no idea. And it can never determine how the symmetry breaking will go. Mm -hmm. Right? The only, I have a sort of flat direction. Mm -hmm. I know that this combination will get a web, but mm -hmm. will file zero get a web? Will phi, phi L get a web or phi R? Or the sum of two of them have no answer. No way of answering, right? Mm -hmm. So then there is this mixed term. So what can happen? That lambda prime minus lambda is positive, and lambda prime minus lambda can be negative. What happens if it's positive? Mm. I have to minimize the energy. Zero. So this must be zero. Mm. So that must one of the values must be zero, not both, because this has a non-zero web mm -hmm. minus mm -hmm. mu square. Mm -hmm. So I learn that one of the webs, and I'm going to call it phi L. Either one is equally good. By the way, this is defining left. In the left right symmetric theory, there is no way of knowing what left is. And phi R, zero square, is non zero. Phi square. Why web if I write zero? If lambda prime minus lambda is non-zero, I would want to have, I would want to minimize the energy by making this as large as possible, therefore both would be non-vanishing, and you, everything is symmetric. You will get in this case that phi L zero is phi R zero. Which is the world that we live in? Actually, it turned out to be that simple. Once you realize this, okay, you could, you could proceed and solve the problem. It took me some time, okay. To, I was just beginning a graduate student, and it took some time to understand that. But it's impressive how simple it is. Obviously, we live in this unit. This is the Higgs that we give the mass to the right-handed guys. This is the answer to Julian's question. There is a this guy is a new scale. In other words, phi r zero is MWR proportion. And if it is a good theory, also M Z prime. This is a prototype of any theory beyond the standard model. This is how the the new physics would work. You need a new Higgs responsible for the breaking of the original symmetry, and then of course you eventually need to break the standard model symmetry. But that we know how to break. I have to raise it and come back to it. So, I'll just summarize the situation. The Higgs sector, you need to break the symmetry. We don't want to spend too much time on that. Okay. This is not something that you have to learn you have to get an idea on. What you have to learn is the standard model. Higgs would have to be uh, in this form. And the theory that defines the modern left right symmetric model, these are triplets. And there must be Higgs responsible for the breaking of the SU2 plus U1 standard model. Okay? In other words, when delta R gets a web, or if you wish, okay, this is my phi L phi R. Example become 
physical field with gauge contour numbers. Okay. The uh, when this takes place, what happens is that the original SU two cross SU two cross U one. You have to show that and. You will not surprise that you manage to show that it is not so hard. Just the way the standard model, which is SU2 cross U1, breaks to U1. We are imitating the breaking, by, by we are just breaking SU2 cross U1 into, of course, this is a different U1. Okay. This was B minus L. This is hypercharge. But the same idea. In the standard model, we broke SU2 cross U1 into a combination inside. So we do the same thing here. We are repeating the pattern of symmetry breaking of the standard model. This break left right to the standard model. In such a way that delta L is zero and delta I is not zero. And then you need a new Higgs, the standard model Higgs which has to be the doublet of SU2L. You know that. There is no discussion of what the standard model Higgs is. Okay? That would have been a question uh, 40, 50 years ago, but today we know what it is. Okay, it's a doublet. We know it's structure, right as you see. So the only thing to understand is it's a doublet that gives mass to the fermions. So in this case, for example, it would typically it would look like this, this doublet. It, the doublet of SU2L, it's a representation that gets a little more complicated. It is what we call a bi-doublet. Notice it has to be doublet on the left and doublet on the right. That's obvious. The world is left right symmetric. If you have a doublet on the left, you're going to have a doublet on the right. This is called a bi-doublet. So, for example, in this theory, there are two doublets. This is an example of two Higgs doublets, not one. Under one Higgs doublet. It turns out that the second doublet is very heavy. Mm. I'm going to wrap it up. I don't want you to. Uh, this is just a little story here. Okay, Jorge. Mm. Well, uh, the right handed uh, Higgs have to be triplets? They don't have to be triplets. Because they. You don't know. You, are, you have the same. You see, you have a dilemma. By the way, when we started out. <coughs> Pati Salam and Mohapadra and myself, uh, we actually started a theory in which these were doublets. <laughs> you don't know. You see, the, this is the issue when you are building a new theory. You have to, you have to struggle to, to see what would be the Higgs. It's not a priori clear, right? In Weinberg's case, it was fairly simple. If he wanted one Higgs, it had to be a doublet in order to give the mass to the fermions and break the symmetry. In the case of a new <laughs> physics, you don't know a priori. Yeah, because you don't know what the world, new world looks like. Now, why the triplets? By the way, in exactly the same manner as this simple example, okay, with just a little more of computational tedium, you show this. With a triplet, you achieve the following. That NWR is G delta R0. Then you get MZ prime. You get a relation similar to the standard model with cosine theta W. OK, I'm not going to write it. It's, it's, it's not exactly the same. Actually, if you ever want to check it, that's how to write it. Let's write like this. MWR, MZR, Z prime, proportional to delta R.
you see the what Higgs you take will not matter so much except that it will give you a definite relation between Z prime and WR. With a doublet we knew the relation. With a triplet it would be a little different. So that is not so crucial. What is very important with a triplet you find out that the right handed neutrino mass you see why I'm talking about the theory. The theory predicts the existence of right handed neutrino it had to be. This is the raison d'etre if you wish. This is why the right handed neutrino exists in this world, okay? Mm -hmm. Instead of postulating it by hand, we were led to it. And then Mn becomes with the properly of Yukawa coupling, call it delta. In other words, you get in this theory what proportional to NWR. The thing that I was saying should be natural in the standard model, and that is to say that the right hand neutrino mass is associated with a new physics. Mm -hmm. It happens naturally. And this is to tell you that the kick should be the triplet. Right? Because in order to write the uh, you see, okay, maybe one last comment here. That you could write the Yukawa coupling L transpose. So there will be L left transpose, C, delta L, left, left, some Yukawa delta, <coughs> plus L R transpose, C delta R, left, right. Okay, this we can see. This is left, left. This is left, and this is right. Leptonic doublet. Let me write nice. With what we learned of, of group theory, this should this should this should be this should be clear. Now notice what I wrote what I've written here. I have L transpose C L. This is a Majorana invariant, right? This is Lorentz invariant. This which we have shown in the homework. This mm -hmm. transforms correctly under Lorentz. So in other words, L transpose C L. This is Lorentz invariant. But this by itself is not it's not SU2 invariant. Right? This is a doublet, this is a doublet. So this is gonna form a triplet. Mm -hmm. Okay, in other words, delta L triplet transforms. This is a definition of delta L. And by the same logic. What is this? This is an adjoint, right? I'm using an adjoint rotation. Okay. It's a uh, uh, com uh, notation. It is always convenient to use the adjoint. We've learned. It is quicker to see what is going on. And therefore, L transpose. This goes into Yukawa delta. L transpose. C, U, L, uh, what do I get? Transpose, right? What is the definition of left and right? These are doublets, quarks and leptons. So then we have sigma 2. 
delta L transforms as UL. Delta L, UL dagger, UL, LL, plus left going into right. So notice UL dagger, UL is unity, and the famous trick UL goes through sigma 2 to become UL dagger. So you see what happens when this guy gets a vacuum excitation value. Remember in the standard model I had to put this by hand, the right-handed neutrino mass, it was a gay singlet, so I put it by hand. Here it would emerge from the spontaneous symmetry break. Mm -hmm. When delta R gets a wave, the only, of course, charge is conserved, the only the neutral component gets a mass. Mm -hmm. So in other words, <coughs> Mn is Yukawa delta. Delta R zero. But delta R zero is responsible for the masses of the new gauge boson. So now you have connected the CISO mechanism, if you wish, the, the neutrino mass, or the mass of the right handed neutrino, to the parity breakdown of the standard model. Okay. I should summarize. Was this clear? Yes. Yes, please. I still Wait. don't see why it's too late. Triplet allows me to have a new interaction. This means that this is a triplet, that this is an adjoint. This is a definition. This interaction defines the quantum number, if you wish, of the state. So delta R is a triplet, but delta L is... Okay. Yeah, it's a triplet, of course. Well, everything is left by symmetric. Only thing that I showed you that I can get, uh, achieve symmetry breaking, which only delta R gets a non vanishing vacuum expectation value. This was the simple example that I took, the toy model. Triplet doublet doesn't matter. Remember, the point was to isolate the term that knew about the relative orientation about these two guys. And also, I mean, it predicts here that the mass of the right-handed neutrino would be heavy because it's proportional to... To the new scape, right? But it's at least natural to say that... But then why not the mass of the right-handed electron not heavy? Oh! Because the light-handed electron cannot get a mass. The right-handed electron, if you get a mass, it will break, uh, all hell would break loose, right? We would break charge. And, and you are saying, why is it that this gives a mass only to the right-handed neutrino, not to the electron? Yes. This is neutral. The symmetry breaking, by, by definition, will be in the neutral component. You agree? That's a definition of the neutral component, whether I use a doublet or a triplet. Remember how we argued in the standard model. When you have one Higgs, there will be one linear combination of, <coughs> of the uh, original uh, neutral generator that remains unbroken. Mm -hmm. That's charge. Mm -hmm. I don't break charge. Therefore, I don't even have to do the algebra. We can do the algebra. Maybe, uh, maybe actually I can... Uh, maybe that could be a nice exercise for you to go through. But you don't have to do it, because if delta R0 preserves charge, then right-handed neutrino cannot get a mass. I don't have to do the algebra. You agree? The same way in the standard model, nothing could go wrong in the standard model if it's charge. I don't have to do the algebra in the standard model. I know that the right-handed electron will not pick up a mass, because charge is conserved after the symmetry breaking. Okay, this is, this is sort of the same logic as the standard model.
you do the algebra, but you don't have to. In the standard model, it is phi zero that gets the web. Mm -hmm. The field phi zero, there are two of them. Okay, let's let's write it like this. Phi is phi plus phi zero. Mm -hmm. <coughs> phi zero gets a web. Therefore, I, am, I, I write down immediately that only the, the charge invariant quantities can, can, can be non-zero, okay? So the right-handed electron. Mm -hmm. So if you wish, it's the direction, delta R goes in the direction of, of charge preserving. But you can and that's, that's, that's a definition of, of charge, if you wish. Uh, what remains unbroken is charge. Mm -hmm. and Look, it's not only the charge. When you have a gauge group, okay, in any physics beyond the standard model, there will be a new gauge group. And that gauge group, in any physics beyond the standard model, today there is no choice. We can standard model is 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 an excellent theory which which has a high precision agreement with, with data. So there will be some new Higgs. Call it beyond the standard model Higgs, like this triplet, which will get a vacuum expectation value. Right? That has to break into <coughs> SU2 plus 1, which is the standard model gauge group. So not <coughs> only charge remains unbroken, all the standard model gauge numbers remain unbroken. So you are safe. Mm -hmm. Nothing can go wrong, okay? You have to respect the symmetry breaking. So what is important that, that your new Higgs is a singlet, the guy that gets a vacuum expectation value under under the standard model, and that is why I I, I call that right-handed. You see, this is a definition of there were there were two fields, left and right. Remember how I, I reason. I know that when lambda prime minus lambda was negative or positive, what was that? Let's remember. <laughs> Let's remember, it's easy to reproduce it. Remember the potential. It can be written, written as a function. In this case, let's say triplet. You can always write it like this, plus a term which I called, I called it lambda prime minus lambda. It's a new term. I could have written it, some alpha. Delta L squared, delta R squared. Mm -hmm. So, When alpha is positive, I want to minimize the energy. And the only way to minimize the energy is that one of them is zero. Now, which one is zero? That's a definition of R. I, there is an equal probability that one of them is zero, but it cannot be left because this is not the reality in which we live. Okay, so. Remember, when we break the symmetry, there is always a vacuum manifold. And any point of the vacuum manifold that is good as the other physics should emerge. So this is the definition of what I call right. If I called it left, then s the other gauge group would be remain unbroken, okay? Then I would just have to change the name. Because we decided to call it left, okay? But this we do afterwards. You see, if you wish the name left, which was associated with how electron interacts, in this theory is associated with the direction of symmetry breaking that is chosen by, by nature. It's this. You should imagine it like this. The potential that I have is sort of like this, always. When it's discrete, right? When phi was going to minus phi, then there will be these two minima. Delta L going to delta R, there will be these two delta L, delta R. Mm. So I put a ball here, this is not stable, and it falls down. Where it falls down, I defines what I want to define. And there is an equal probability that it falls down in any direction. Okay. And the physics will not depend what I choose, just the name will depend. Since I already established that left is the standard model gauge symmetry, what is broken I'm going to call right. Yes. Right?
there is more to, there is more computational tedium in the theory, but there is also some beauty that you start to understand the deeper the things that you got to use that you call left and right. All of this becomes now more meaningful. And and so once again, when I choose my delta R field, there will be component to be non-zero. This will be by definition one which is neutral. That's how I define it in the standard model. Remember in the standard model. I told you don't get confused because I could have chosen this to be zero vacuum expectation value. It's not that I would break charge then. This is very important. I would call this neutral and I would call this phi minus. It was just a name. And I can always achieve that to be the one case. Okay. Mm. Question. Yes, please. Mm, if, so mm. you said that we didn't give my um mass to the right-handed electron because it would be it would break charge. Yeah, I, I didn't say that because it will break charge. I said it will not give it because charge is conserved. I don't have to check it, mm -hmm. but I could check it if I don't believe in in symmetry. Mm. For example, when I when I when I choose in the standard model when I choose the symmetry breaking in this direction. I know that photon will not get a mass. I don't have to do the exercise. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I give you an exercise, and you go and check it, and uh, lo and behold, photon was massless. But this is new without doing any calculation, OK? Because there was a direction in which the, the, the symmetry was preserved. The heck you know already, you learned it as a theorem, that in that direction, of course, the photon is massless. They engage here. This was the direction uh, in which nothing will happen in the global case. And then, of course, they justify the direction. You know, mathematically, what happens is you have a new R transpose, ER, if you wish, really. Then this delta L field, you have to study its, its, its charge structure. It turns out that it has a web along this component. Well, you have to you have to then to do some 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 algebra. Mm -hmm. There's charge conjugation. So I get zero. And uh, is this what I wanted? Maybe that's not what I want. Yeah, it will be zero B. Zero B. This is not what I want to write. Should be the other one. The, the no, there was right sigma two. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the sigma two. It goes into that direction, okay, it turns out. But there was sigma two <laughs> here, which reverses the direction. So what happens is you get this. You see how you can be. You could easily make a mistake when you do the, the, the uh, but it has to come out right. No, again. Let's take I sigma 2 minus 1, 0. Then I said that the web goes into this direction. And I have to think. This is new R transpose. OK, I, I ask you to take my word for that, OK? You have to study the. the the charge structure of this triplet, okay. New R transpose, ER transpose, I could actually, if you do that, see, what do I get here? VR, mm -hmm. zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. New R, ER. Mm -hmm. And this is new R transpose, C, new R. Mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. VR. Mm -hmm. Now, right? Mm -hmm. Ahmed is. Uh, Because of Sigma 2. This was a structure that. Uh, you see, there will be a certain direction. Remember, okay, this is sort of. How do you make sure that you are not wrong? Remember in the standard model, I, I keep, I cannot overemphasize that. That there is, can be no confusion that charge can be broken. Because if you call this a web, you don't call it phi plus anymore. You call that thing, you call neutral. So here what will happen? Anyway, one of these two guys will get a mess, new R and ER. If it happens that ER gets a mess, that's a bad name. That means you should go back and redefine your fields. Because it's neutral <laughs> guy is going to get, uh, and this could have made by group uh, theory like minor mistake. You can make a mistake because you forget that, that when you, for example, write this, that you already defined the charge to be in this direction. There was always a question when I say that speak of field phi in the standard model. Am I speaking of phi or phi tilde? Because phi tilde is the tilde of phi, but phi is the tilde of phi tilde. Therefore, it will always adjust itself. Okay. The thing that 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 remain survives is the guy that you call neutral. That's what you would call a photon. And you could make it, make it easily mistake in your manipulations, okay, and think that you're going to breaking of charge, but that cannot be. Either. Okay. You see, I was getting e ER to get, imagine that the way I was writing, remember, I would get ER to get a mass. Well, it just means that I should change the name and I should call the ER new R. That means I, I have goofed in the quantum numbers of, of T3, what is up, what is down, obviously. The thing is here, if this field is phi plus, phi zero, <laughs> this field is phi zero, star, minus phi minus, and this field is equally good as this field. So if you take the wave in this direction, please, it's neutral by definition, okay? So in the same way here, the guy that gets a mass, it's a neutrino because charge is not broken. Okay. So what did I, did I, what did I achieve? with all of this. I mean, all of this that I'm bugging you to, to sort of at least to hear the story, not really learn, but to hear the story, makes sense only if I do better than we did in the standard model. Okay? So, at least, you can see sort of if you have a giant that put the ball here, that if I can go into this vacuum, I can restore the symmetry. So it's not surprising that at high energies, when I have an accelerator that can reach the energies, which are the energies of the mass of WR, I should start seeing parity restoration, right? The same way in the standard model, when I go to the high energies, W boson starts to look very similar, or at least Z boson to the photon. The only difference was the mass between Z and the... So, so what we achieved, this is the crucial statement that Mn is not an arbitrary thing, but it's something which is... So when I write the neutrino mass, which was minus M dirac, <coughs> M dirac, notice this will be proportional to MWR. You get a relation between neutrino mass and parity breakdown. Why is neutrino masses in the standard model? Because you're assuming maximum parity violation. You're taking WR to infinity. Mm. So the smallness of neutrino mass is equivalent <coughs> to the maximality or the largeness of P violation. Now we have a sort of physical understanding 
of this interesting fact about the small neutrino mass. Neutrino is light because parity is broken so strong. And the difference between this guy who says this and the standard model guy is that you are just saying this is not infinite. So at least we have a physical picture for neutrino mass. Number two, the new guy, the right-handed neutrino, has new gauge interactions. Remember, I could not produce in the seesaw picture the right-handed neutrino. And if I don't produce the right-handed neutrino, why in the world am I talking about that? If I know that in principle I cannot do it, forget it. Now here, I will have a new interaction which is G, N bar, R, gamma mu, ER, W mu, R, plus. There'll be a new gauge interaction by definition, right? Where there is left, there is right. Okay. So when you want to work out details of the theory, it's very easy. Okay. Whatever you saw before in the left-handed picture. So all I have to do is produce WR. But I can produce WR, <coughs> well, it depends on its mass. I can produce WR once I produce WR, then I will produce this guy N. And you are studying this decay for the homework, okay? You have all kinds of interesting things we can learn. Let's talk a, a little bit more on Wednesday when you do the homework, okay? I want to emphasize something that would help you understand better the homework, so I don't want to do that. <coughs> so N becomes physical. Now another th thing is important to see what is happening there. How would you produce WR? Of course you would produce WR, I'm sorry, the way you produce WL, right? You scatter proton on proton, inside the proton there'll be uh, a down quark and there'll be a, a anti up quark. There are also anti quarks inside the proton. Tomorrow, if you build a PP bar machine, so much the better. There is even more of U bar inside. Then you produce WR minus, you produce the electron, and so on and so forth. This is how you saw the, the W, right? Ruby and Tal, so W like this. There was missing energy here, it would be very different. There would be no missing energy, okay? But before we say that, remember we said. And there was a dangerous statement that there is a probe <coughs> of my run neutrino mass. And let's say neutrino is double beta decay. Which has this diagram. WL, EL, EL, WL. And this is the propagation of new L, so it's my random mass. I'm drawing no lines just for, to emphasize the structure. Well, in the left-right symmetric theory, if there is left, there is right. So therefore, they will be mediated in this process. WR, WR, ER, ER, and here there will be N. You agree? So I can call it right-handed, it's going through the right-handed current, but there is both state, okay? No, I, I shouldn't confuse you, this is new and then. There is always left and right, particle, <coughs> and right particle inside that. How would this, what did, we, what did we get here, remember? We got G to the fourth over NW to the fourth. To propagate it, we did it the other day, we got MU divided by p squared minus mn squared time the uh, current. You remember m nu came through the violation of the left hand number because it's my run. This m nu squared. This is from the propagator. Okay. m nu is very small, so we got g to the fourth over mw to the fourth m nu over p squared. What do you expect here?
the VG to the force. Remember the couplings are the same, the theory is left-back symmetric. Divide the MWR to the force. Agree? By the same logic as before, I do the same calculation, there is nothing measured here. There will be Mn and there will be M P squared <coughs> minus Mn squared. Let's write the whole thing. Well, remember what I told you that typically in the nuclear, the people look like this is about 100 MeV. Huge compared to the neutrino mass, but tiny compared to the mass of this new guy which lives at this large scale. So here it's a bit different. So this goes with g to the 4, mwr over the 4, 1 over mn. It's kind of neat. The lighter mn and now the logic is opposite, you have to remember. So it all boils down what is the mass of the wr. Mm -hmm. And remember what, what, what I argued, what, what we sort of said. What was this about c? So the thing is that. I don't know what M Dirac is, but we said, look, it will be natural that if M Dirac was a water <coughs> ME. Remember we said that, okay, at least this C so now gives us an idea of what is going on, and we found out that MN should then weigh around TV, if you remember, 10 to the 3 GV. Between 100 and 1,000, okay, we put the number from the C so far. Right, M nu, Mn is M dx squared. <coughs> so you see, it's interesting. Imagine that this guy is around TV to be seen these days at the LFC. This will become more important than the other thing, okay? You lose and you gain, okay? We could, we could try to put the numbers if you wish. I mean, what do I, what do I gain here? I'm going through W, but then mu is very tiny. I don't want to put the numbers, you can play with it. It's not clear who wins if you put the numbers. And I don't want to put the numbers very seriously because I don't know them. This is what I wanted to emphasize you, okay? This is what we wrote in a paper with Moa Pater many years ago, that it's not true that neutrino is double beta decay is a measure of neutrino mass. You don't know who is causing it. It's a measure of neutrino mass if such new physics doesn't exist. And this idea was raised already in the 50s by Goldhaber, that I mentioned very often, a great experimentalist that mentioned helicity spin and Feinberg. They emphasize that there could be new physics, therefore you never know <coughs> this process by itself is not enough. You should keep that in mind, okay? And this is a prototype. This is a kind of new physics that could do it. Now, a few more minutes and I finish. Mm, I have a quick question. Please. Uh, if you were to produce WR, the quarks should also be uh, Very good. right handed, right? Very good. Let's now uh, let's now uh, let's talk about the production of WR. You see, if I cannot tell you who does it, mm -hmm. and I can, <coughs> and I'm often unable to do that, I can still do good physics if I can correlate this with some other physical process. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't know why one process is taking place. When you correlate it with another one apparently different, you are achieving progress. And that will be precisely what Ahmed is asking me, production of WR. Okay. So let's talk a bit about the production of WR. <coughs> Remember that the quarks are charged particles. Charged particles don't exist as left-handed or right-handed. They have their own little masses. They have electromagnetic interactions. They both send left and right. So what I get inside the proton is both left and right-handed quarks. 
when I produce a WL, then it selects a left-handed guy. <coughs> but this would equally select a right-handed guy. So this is not going to be the problem. It is true what you said. The guy would have to be right-handed, but it lives inside the proton. It's established by, 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 by QCD. QCD is left-right symmetric, OK? QCD doesn't distinguish between left and right. The only thing that does is the W, OK? Remember, it's the weak interactions. That distinguish. <coughs> so notice this process, OK? What is happening here? Look at this interesting thing. Okay, when, when we found out if, if, if there is a Majorana mass, non-zero, the textbook says that there is a lepton number changing process zero, no two beta, okay? Realized in the 30s. And search for. And I want to show you that there is another process automatically. Just by this. There must be similar violation at Androni colliders, okay? Something in 1983, we pointed out with my friend Kyung, the guy which is responsible for the form of the VCKM that I can mention, who was my collaborator at Brookhaven. So look at this. What is happening here? It's down quark, really, is becoming an up quark. Mm -hmm. So in other words, down quark enters, and up quark goes out. But up quark goes out is equivalent to anti up quark enter. This is equivalent. Mm -hmm. So this is this vertex, you agree? Mm -hmm. Whereas this is giving me the decay of a neutron to a proton at the machine like LHC. This is a production of WR, the same vertex. Okay, I'm just, this exists, obviously. <coughs> then I get an electron going out, and this N. N should never have an error, remember, because this guy is both particle and antiparticle. Strictly speaking, there are arrows pointing both ways. If you point it like this, it will go through its mass. Therefore, there's going to be this vertex also. Notice I'm drawing the same, I'm just rotating in the plane. I'm drawing the same diagram, OK? Mm -hmm. This is a deep connection between low energy physics and, and, and hydro colliders, OK? Which was the missing link. This is now becoming a, a paradigm for lepton overvaluation colliders, OK? Now it's becoming very important search. Both Atlas and CMS are now looking for this. WR, WR decays into two quarks. Quark and anti quark, that I call proton and neutron, but these are actually quarks. So, what is this? If this is electron, this would be uh, WR minus, giving me an electron. Is this going to be WR plus? Yes, this is neutron. Yes. There's a proton. So, this will give me up quark. Look, it's up quark going out. Mm -hmm. Precisely, okay. This we have to think a little bit. This was actually not proton, but in low energy physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, up quark is going out and D is entering. But that's like D bar going out. This is what we call jets at, at colliders. These guys hadronize. They come with a huge energy, okay. So <coughs> in, 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 and very quickly they hadronize. So you have a, you get a sort of bunch, a hadronic bunch with more or less collinear in that direction. These are called jets. So in other words, if there is neutrino less double beta decay, it implies the collider production P plus P, for example, LHC, going into two electrons plus two jets. You will get electrons out of nothing. Again, this beautiful thing of lepton number violation. You see, the same thing will happen in the standard model. Just the neutrino mass is so small that the effect is negligible. But at low energies, neutrino mass can actually no it, it is extremely tiny, but it can induce this process just because <coughs> this momentum is not so huge. 
When I go to the colliders, if I do the analogous thing, this will be WL, WL. Mm -hmm. And this is why people overlooked it for, for such a long time, for years and years. Because this will be a left-hand neutrino, and the process will be negligible, because the energy is not 100, 100 MeV here. We talk about the energies which are over hundreds of GeV, or TV, or few TV, I don't know, in the end. But you can see that if, if we were lucky, that this naturalness of masses were to be valid, and we were in the TV region, as the naturalness suggests, we would see spectacular process at the LHC. Now, unlike the neutrinos double beta decay, but you just see that it's two place. Here you would measure everything. You know how you measure the mass of WR? You see the peak by measuring the energy and momentum of the final states, the discovery of the W boson. Bright Wigner, the cross section will be huge. So you can measure MWR, you measure its spin and so on, you know, you measure all the things that you did. Uh, you measure these three final states. You have to be smart and careful and they know how to do that. And you measure the mass of N. You measure, you look at the different leptons here and you probe the mixing angles. Remember there are of course mixing angles. That we can say next time a few words. Even if we forget all the new physics, okay, the neutrinos have a mass, and these are heavy neutrinos, they are mixing angles, just in the standard model. So another thing, okay, that I will talk after the homework, there is another very interesting <coughs> thing that will emerge here, but I don't want to say it today. Okay, I'm about to wrap it up. When the LAC shuts down and doesn't discover WR, I'm going to be poor. <laughs> One question. We need a new collider, obviously, right? We need to do particle physics. Okay. Mm, this point you are, going, you are making the bet. Oh, whoever is willing. So I have many bets. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's willing, you know, because you, you're not going to believe in this unless it's your baby or something. <laughs> I'm actually betting that this is a DLS <laughs> energy. As you know, all of this physics, as beautiful as it may and appealing it may be, I don't know if it appears beautiful to you. It does appear to me. I don't like a crippled world. I, I, I was a... Uh, I was a little kid, I think I was four or five years old, when I first time became aware of, of the left-right thing in the mirror, with a huge rainbow in my parents had a room, and I was fascinated by that. I was staring this left becoming right. And some 20 years later I found out I can do physics by thinking about the same thing that I thought as a little kid. Now that's the best you can do in life. When the physics reduces to something that you know and understand. So you can imagine that that this appeal to me. And I just want to tell you that the reason I think it ought to be taken seriously, why am I advocating it and even teaching it here and I don't stop, is first, the, the, what did the theory achieve? First, it told us that there must be right hand neutrino. Second, it gave us CSO. Three, it gave us connection between LHC, or let's call them hadronic colliders. and low energy physics. You know, I can make, I can make correlations if I measure these mixing angles. You know, if, you, if, if I see this, I can tell you how much neutrinos double beta decay you will get. There is a uh, beautiful work that Teo, one of our ex-diploma students who went on to do PhD mm -hmm. at CIS with me did in his PhD work a beautiful analysis how you would reproduce all the details here. Okay, he studied it deeply by doing the LAC experiments. Okay, because it's the same particle that enters here and there. Unlike the neutrino case in which this is negligible here, they are correlated. Therefore, you're not going to see this without seeing this. Uh, the, the last thing, just to say, we have this, i tell you a little more, the very important thing that because of left-right symmetry, 
M Dirac, and if it is parity, then M Dirac is M D dagger. If it's charge conjugation, M D is M D transpose. <coughs> Please just take my word for it. Relax and just think about what you're gonna eat, okay? This is just words. In other words, M D, because of left right symmetry, M D connects left to right, so it's not arbitrary. Okay, maybe I should. Well, or maybe I should show you. Or maybe I won't. No, it's not fair to bug you with this. Only if there are questions. If there is really interest, we can give it really. The bottom line, all I want to tell you, that ambiguity goes away. Okay. For example, in this. Imagine that this was true. Let me give you an example. Just take my word now, but imagine that it's true what I said that M Dirac is M Dirac transpose because of the underlying left right symmetry. Then the CISO formula becomes M nu minus M Dirac Mn to the minus 1 M Dirac. <coughs> Not transpose. Now let's multiply this by 1 over Mn. So I will get mn to the minus 1, m nu, is minus mn to the minus 1, m dirac, mn to the minus 1, m dirac. So we get immediately that mn to the minus 1 m dirac is a square, is a square root times the factor y of mn to the minus 1 m nu. Mm -hmm. m dirac is a term. Yes. In other words, m dirac is mn times i, square root of mn to the minus 1 m nu. Mm -hmm. Ambiguity goes away completely. By the way, I cannot enter inside here. These are square roots of matrices. Mm -hmm. But the point is that it's determined. I can write the formula for all. It is not. It disappears. It's basically one, if you wish. I can show you that it's a order one, and I can show you that in some simple cases it becomes one. Mm -hmm. Similar things we achieved recently. It took us a long time. Let me tell you, we've been working on this. It's strange. It took us years to do the other case. But bottom line is that the theory is self-contained, it's complete. In other words, it does the same thing with Weinberg does for the charge fermions. You give me the neutrino masses, I can predict you this M Dirac, which is the theta mixing. This is how N coupled, remember? Mn minus 1 M Dirac. Mn minus 1 M Dirac, it's even better. It's here, I should have written like this, okay. <laughs> Theta is, oh, this is maybe which is more, more, more illustrative. Is mn to the minus one m nu. No ambiguity whatsoever, now you see. It's gone, it's even more illustrative than it was. And therefore, I can make predictions for the way n interacts with the left-handed particle. This is what you are doing in your homework, okay. You can calculate how n the case into W and the electron, okay, I'll come to you on Wednesday, finish the homework again, I can tell you what we could learn. It's sort of interesting, we could learn all kinds of physics. We would actually know, all we, had, we would have to see that, we would know what the origin of C, neutrino mass, we would see the seesaw mechanism, we would see the Higgs origin of neutrino mass. The only thing we have to be lucky as hell that it flies in the machine, which is accessible, okay? Okay, I finish on this note. We won't say anything anymore about, until the last day, about beyond the standard model physics. We'll have to go back to the standard model for the next couple of weeks. I can... Uh, no urgent question. Mm -hmm. <coughs>